going to continue our series in the life of Samson. We have been looking at the self-destruction that came from the life of Samson. And over the last three weeks, we have looked at some self-destructive patterns that he had in his life, the pattern of uh, lust and of pride and of anger. And I just want to say that these patterns are still found in many people in our world today. And it just seems like as we've been studying Samson, he is a man that is out of control. It really seems that way. And, uh, you know, one has to wonder whether or not he ever had really enjoyed being a Nazarite, a Nazarite. You see, God had called Samson to be a Nazarite even before he was born. And he's kind of completely disregarded that vow. He's, he, he is, as a Nazarite, he was never to touch a dead animal or drink wine or eat grapes or cut his hair. Yet a careful study of the scripture, what do we find him doing? He's throwing a drinking party. He's in a vineyard. We find him touching dead bodies. And, and so we have to ask ourselves, how did Samson get there with this rebelliousness within him? And yet, in my mind, I can hardly imagine that young little Samson was that disrespectful to God and to his parents. In fact, there's one scripture that makes me think that Samson had at one point really enjoyed the Spirit of God. And that scripture is found in Judges chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. And you can follow along in your notes or on the screen today. This is what the Word of God says. It says, So the woman bore a son... And called his name Samson, and the child grew. Notice what happened. It says, the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanan Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. And the reason why I think that Samson's heart was tender to the Lord is because this kind of reminds me of me, this scripture. You know, because as a young boy in elementary and junior high and high school, I remember the Spirit of God starting to move upon me, and uh, not the same way as Samson, obviously, but, but you know, when you felt the anointing and the touch of God, you remember it, right? And so when I see Samson in his adult life, and his heart is far from God, I have to ask myself, what happened? How did that boy that God blessed and the Spirit moved on become the self-destructive man that we've been studying? And the first thing I want to say is I don't think it happened overnight, right? I don't think Samson just woke up one day and said, I hate my vows, I hate my destiny, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. But rather, I believe that when Samson began affiliating with the culture at large, out from underneath, Kind of the watchful eyes of his parents, something started to happen. I believe he started to drift away, a slow drifting away. And by the way, it wasn't just Samson in that day. If you look at the people of God in Samson's day, you see how across generations and across the time of the various judges, the hearts of their people and their devotion to God slowly moved away from complete devotion to God to being far away from God. And just like the entire nation had drifted away from God, it had, one day at a time, one decision at a time, even so Samson had done that. And you see, what happened was that the children of God were very compromised in their relationship with God. They now lived at peace with the people who had conquered them. Many of the Israelites, I believe, were, you know, checking out the Philistine gods. That Many paid their tribute to the king of the Philistines, and, you know, just like they were helpless, and like Jehovah God could not help them. It had no power, no strength, no authority, and the whole culture had kind of drifted away. And even the people of God, they weren't even crying out to God anymore. And I can tell you, I'm sure that, that, that Samson wasn't the only guy who wanted to marry a Philistine. And so Jehovah God was on the back burner. And, and let's just remember that just a few generations before this, these very people 
were the ones who had conquered Canaan, right? They had went in, the Jericho's walls had fallen, the Jordan River had been dried up, 31 different kings had been defeated, and they had done all that by faith. But what happened? What happened? What happened was a slow drifting away. And I want us to understand that this is a huge warning to every believer. Do I have any believers in the house today? Come on. Hebrews 12 and verse number 1, I'm sorry, verse 2 and verse 1 tells us this. It says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may, what's it say? Drift away from it. Now, how many of you know drifting is dangerous? Right, it is. It's dangerous. People have been in rivers on boats knowing there was a waterfall downstream and not paying any attention. All of a sudden, they got past the point of no return. And yes, they've even went over Niagara Falls that way. Drifting is dangerous. You drift left of center while you're driving on the highway, while you're texting. Come on, somebody. That, that's a sure way to perish. And let me tell you, if we drift spiritually, it can be devastating. And the drift in our life spiritually is hardly ever intentional, right? Here's what happens. Life. Life happens. We get around people who are unbelievers or they have a negative influence and they, they begin to subtly draw us away. Hurts happen. Circumstances come. We get distracted. Busyness crowds out the priority of our relationship with God. And we begin to drift away. Our hearts just slowly grow colder and we wander further from Him. We feel spiritually empty and we feel apathetic. And that's a tragedy in our lives. So when we're talking about drifting from God, what do we mean? We mean that we're drifting, uh, we're being carried away from what we once believed about God, what we once believed about Jesus Christ, about the church, about the Bible. Uh, And that happens when we listen to the currents of our culture that pull us away. And so in this passage today, what I see are some very evident signs of drifting. They were true in Samson's day, and they're true today, right? Uh, drifting happens, all right? These are some subtle things, a couple of them, and, but the first one really isn't so subtle. Here's how you know that you're drifting spiritually, all right? Number one, you know you're drifting when you are cowering instead of fighting. When you're cowering instead of fighting. How many of you think it would have been real easy for Kathy just to say, well, I guess she's just going to be gone. I I guess, oh, well, there's not much I can do. You know what she would have been doing? In that moment, she would have been cowering. But she said, "Uh uh-uh, this ain't happening to my daughter. I'm taking authority over this thing in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. We have got to be in the fight. And and let's pick up our story and kind of remind us of where we're at with old Samson, all right? Samson had caught 300 foxes. Don't ask me how he did it. I have no idea. He had tied their tails together, put torches in them, burned down the enemy's wheat fields, the vineyards, the olive crop, and the Philistines said, who did this? And they said, you know who it was? It was Samson who did it because uh, his father-in-law gave his wife to somebody else. So they went and they got upset about that. They went to Samson, I guess we could call her his ex fiance's house, and burned it to the ground, killing her and her father. And Samson now is pretty upset, and he says, I'm really going to get revenge now. And he attacks them, and this is how the Bible describes it, as he attacks them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. I don't know what that means, but I don't want it to happen to me, all right? And so uh, the Philistines were not about to be outdone. So let's pick up the story in 15 and verse 9. That something interesting happens here. It says, Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lahid. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? Now, what is sad about this is that the ancestors of these men at least knew who the enemy was. 
The book of Judges opens with this very tribe, the tribe of Judah, leading the way into battle. But now where are they? They've drifted so far away from God. They're saying, why are you attacking us? And what is sad is that they don't know the answer to that question. They have lost sight completely of the fact that these people were the enemy. They should have been the ones driving them out, attacking them. They were supposed to be separated from them. But the tribe of Judah, in fact, all of Israel, had just grown content to live among their enemies. And so they're like, why are you attacking us? You know, we pay our tribute. You know, what do you want us to do? Why are we going? Why are you doing this to us? And so let me give you a principle this morning. You can write this down. All right. This is a powerful principle. When there's no spiritual conflict between God's people and the world, it's because the world has taken over. When there's no conflict between God's people and the world, it's because the world has taken over. Someone might say to you this morning, man, the enemy's been attacking me. People told me that as a pastor. I said, well, of course he is. You're in a battle. You're in a struggle, right? You are a threat to his kingdom, especially if you're on fire for God. Do I got any on fire people? If you're on fire for God, if you're living for him, if you're praying, if you're in the word, if you're sharing your faith, man, you better expect to fight. But you see, here's the issue that we have in our world today. We have too many believers in the modern church that are just like the men of Judah. They used to be out leading the fight, but today... They're just, they don't even know really who their enemy is. They've given up the battle. How many of you know you can give up the fight? You have family that needs Christ. Some people give up the fight. Oh, well, that's their choice. I'm just going to, let me tell you something. Don't do that. Keep praying. Keep believing. Come on, somebody. When somebody's sick, don't give up the fight. Keep believing God. Keep trusting God. When you have a financial need, don't give up the fight. Keep standing and believing and trusting in the Lord. And I want you to know that as a believer, you are clearly called to fight on three different battlefronts. Let me give them to you today. The first battlefront is this, the devil. I'm talking about principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Come on. You are called to engage and fight against spiritual forces of darkness. You and I have an adversary. His name is Satan. He is like a roaring lion and he's going about looking for those whom he may devour. And it is our job to resist him. Come on, somebody. It's our job to stand up against him. It's our job to say, no, you will not have your way in this world. Uh, You say, well, how do I fight? Here's how you fight. You fight when you come and you say, tell the devil no more. And you get your spiritual weapons out. You say, Pastor Bob, you mean I've got spiritual weapons? I I mean, I've got a nine millimeter at home, but I'm talking about spiritual weapons, not physical weapons, right? Can I give you a couple of weapons that you have? The first one is the powerful name of Jesus. Come on. I'm telling you, when you pray, you don't pray in the name of Buddha. Amen. You pray in the name of Jesus because his name is powerful. Come on. And then you have something called the blood of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. The enemy cannot cross over the bloodline. And I believe in the old fashioned way of praying where you say, Lord Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, over my house, over my home. Devil, you cannot get in here because of the blood of Jesus. Come on. Amen. And then what you do is you take the sword of the spirit, by the way, which is the word of almighty God. And you say, devil, this is what God's word says. Let me quote it to you. Let me read it to you. I know what it says, and I'm claiming its promises. Come on, somebody. 
We do not want to be like the men of Judah who cowered in when they should have been fighting. Here's what I've got to say today. If you're one of those and you've given up on something where you used to believe, listen, God brought you here this morning to get your fight back. Come on, somebody. God put you here to realize that you can win the fight. Let me tell you why. Because you've got Jesus on the inside. You've got God the Father standing beside behind you and all around you and inside of you, you are immersed in the third person of the Trinity. Oh, come on, I feel like preaching today. Oh, hallelujah. And the devil is not your only enemy. You've also got to fight against the world. The world. And I don't mean the mountains and the trees and the lakes and the streams. I mean the satanically inspired world system that is constantly trying to impose its thoughts into our mind. The world system makes you want to wants to make you think like everybody else, act like everybody else, dress like everybody else, drink what everybody else drinks, talk like everybody else, watch what everybody else does. Come on and go after the same things with the same values as the world have. And, and I want to tell you something: some believers are at peace with the world, and tragically, some are even friends with the world. But the Bible says this: that friendship with the world is enmity with against God. Come on, somebody. But I know that there are some believers in this house today that have said this. Listen, I am not going to be like the world. I have put my eyes on Jesus. I have set my course. Amen. And have looking at the author and the finisher of my faith. I have decided to follow Jesus and I am not turning back. Come on. Do I have any people that believe that God is able to give us victory over over the world. And the Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Come on. And then there's another place where we can't cower. And this is, I think, the toughest enemy that we have. It's the world, the devil, and who else? The flesh. The biggest battle sometimes as we have is within our own desires. The war within And it's easy to give up in that regard. Well, that's just who I am, I guess. That's just, you know, my daddy was that way. My mama was that way, you know. You know, it just kind of runs in our family. The devil's a liar. Come on. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his lusts and affections. Come on. Do I have any believers in the house that says, I'm not going to cower? Come on. Let's get back to the men of Judah for a moment. The men of Judah say, why have you come up against us? Judah 15 and verse 10, so they answered, we have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And as he and he said to them, as they did to me, so have I done to them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistine. Now, just picture how far these people had drifted. They have gathered not a hundred or two hundred, three thousand of their men to go down and arrest Samson. Deliver him to the Philistines. They have literally come to arrest the God-appointed deliverer and savior for their people and hand him over to their enemies. My, my, my. You know what they were doing? They were cowering in front of the Philistines, weren't they? Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him and said, Oh, no, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. But we will surely not kill you. And so they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. So apparently Samson cared enough about his people to allow him to do that. I'll give him a little credit there, right? But they're delivering Samson into the hand of the enemies and 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 it's kind of funny that they bound him with two new ropes. Those old ropes wouldn't do, but boy, we're going to tie him with these new ropes. That's going to hold him. 
Yeah. Yeah. How many of you know if God was with them, they could have had titanium ropes and they would have broke? Come on. And then we get to one of my favorite parts of the stories from when I was a kid. I've been waiting for this. Judges 15, 14, and 15. It says this, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Man, that'd be scary, wouldn't it? Come on, man. I know y'all have seen some movies. You've seen what the thousand warriors look like. And they're coming, they're shouting, they're mad. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the ropes that were on his arm became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Now, I know we don't want to glorify violence, but this was an amazing feat. Come on. How are we supposed to respond? We're supposed to respond to this by saying, he did what? He did what with what? And, you know, a lot of people criticize him, you know, for touching a dead animal. But, hey, if a thousand warriors were shouting at me and coming at me, I think I'd grab whatever I could as well. And just so happened to happen to be a, a jawbone of a donkey. By the way, it was a fresh jawbone. It had some density to it. And it became, in Samson's hand, a very deadly weapon, right? But the thing I want us to see here is that if God could empower one man, one man with the jawbone of a donkey to kill a thousand, what would have happened if all 3,001 would have went against the enemy? Come on. Apparently, the 3,000 men who brought him up to deliver him into the hands of the Philistines did nothing. So here is my question. What could those 3,000 men have done for the glory of God had they joined in the battle? And I can see them there as they're cowering, running for cover, saying, Oh, no, Samson is picking a fight. Hmm. I remember when my wife, Jereen, had her her first retinal detachment, and Raul Ortiz was a good friend of ours at that time and part of this church. I'll never forget what he said. We had a prayer meeting, and he came. He said this. He said, I came to pick a fight. Man, I love that, brother, man. I came to pick a fight. Come on. Amen. Wouldn't it be amazing if how much we could accomplish if every single believer would have that fighting spirit down on the inside of them? If we would stand up against the enemy? If we would pray like we believe God answered prayer? If we would stand in faith even though everything around us seems to be crumbling? Come on. I'm going to tell you something. I know I've got a church that doesn't cower when we should be fighting. Come on. Well, let me give you another way you know that you're drifting. Secondly, You're boasting when you should be praising. You're boasting when you should be praising. It is there is no way humanly possible that one man, without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, right, could fend off one thousand angry Philistines on his own, and especially if all he had for a weapon was the jawbone of a donkey, right? I mean, I would have really loved to have seen the look on the face of those 3,000 guys, right? You know, after the battle is over, there's Samson. I'm going to try to, you picture what he must have looked like after whacking a thousand men in the head. Come on. He was a mess. And God, the Holy Spirit had been all over him, bringing him to this place of victory, right? Not because Samson had lived such a righteous life, but simply because Samson was a tool in the hand of a sovereign God who wanted enmity between the Israel and the Philistines. But at any rate, he's standing there, bloody jawbone in hand, and you would have thought that the situation would have made Samson fall to his knees and say, Praise you, God, that you rescued me and you delivered me and you empowered me to do this by your Spirit. Samson should be praising God. He should be thanking God. But let's look at what happens. Samson tries to get cute. All right? 
He tries to say something cute to lift himself up. Judges 15 and verse 16, this is what it says. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Now, we translate that out from the Hebrew, and it doesn't really come out like it ought to come out, because this was kind of a little play on words. It was kind of like a little rap song, a little rhyming and jiving. You know, Samson's like the guy who made the touchdown, and, and you know, he caught the pass, and he's now in the end zone. You know, I don't know what they all do. I can't do it like they do it. But he's having a little victory dance out there. It's a song in which he was the hero. Apparently, the word for donkey and the word for heap are sound very, very similar. Similar, So it was a play on words. And so someone tried to put this in a more modern term so we can kind of get the feel of it like a rap artist, all right? So I'm going to try my very best to rap this little phrase. Come on. With the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in a mass. That's all I got. With the jawbone of an ass... I have piled them in a mass. He's trying to be cute. He's trying to be funny. He's trying to make something like, ain't I cool? Look at me. Now, there's something missing from this song. Huh. I mean, when, when they watched the march across the Red Sea, a lady by the name of Miriam got her timbrel out. She had a dance, right? That dance was all about the great and mighty powerful God who the, threw the horse and the rider into the sea and how they came across on dry ground because of God's greatness. Come on. Even in the book of Judges, Deborah had a song, and Deborah's song was all about giving glory to those who went to the battle and the God who won the battle. Come on. But you see, something was missing from this little song. It was the praise that God deserved. He was boasting in himself instead of praising God. Judges 15 and verse 17 says, And so it was, when he had finished speaking, he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramath Lahi. And by the way, the meaning of Ramath Lahi is elevation of the jawbone. Not elevation of the spirit that empowers, but it's like elevation of a donkey's jawbone. Can I tell you a funny story about Jolene? How many like to hear something funny about her? She's, she's wondering what I'm going to say. This is true. True story. I wouldn't tell you a false story. I hope not. Many years ago, we went to a rodeo in Stamford, Texas. All right? Stamford, Texas is a small little town out there, 37 miles north of Abilene. Everybody talks like this out there. It was the Texas Cowboy Reunion, all right? It's an amateur rodeo. All right, so we're there watching the amateur rodeo, and it's time for the bull riding. And the amateur cowboy gets on a bull, and, uh, man, he got hurt. He got hurt pretty bad. I'm going to be honest. He got gored, and he got stomped, and there was some blood, and he was carried away in an ambulance. And just like this crowd just grew quiet, so did the crowd right there. It grew quiet. So then the next guy gets on the bull, right? And he doesn't last a hot second. I mean, that bull comes out. He goes flying. Boom, he gets up. He's perfectly fine. But you know what he's doing? He's cussing, and he's stomping around, and he's throwing his hat on the ground. And the next thing I hear, I mean, he's still quiet because of the of the ambulance and all that. It's still quiet. Next thing I hear, my wife is on her feet, and she's yelling, Buddy, you better be praising Jesus! You could have been killed out there. What's the matter with you? They carried the last guy out of here in an ambulance. What is wrong with you? Get up and praise the Lord. Stop cussing. Stop throwing your hat on the ground. I've never took a kept Jareen back to another rodeo. Had Jareen been there and heard Samson? 
she would have said, why are you making up a little funky song like that one? You better praise God for what he's done. One sign that you are drifting from your commitment to Christ is when you start taking credit for what God has done. Come on. Amen. When you start boasting in how great you are, you are blowing it. Come on. How many of you know all the praise, all the glory, all the honor goes to Jesus? Come on, somebody. Amen. And you can tell a praiser or a boaster simply by listening. What comes out of their mouth tells what's in their heart. And believers know one thing. God gets the credit for everything. Come on. Because without Him, we can do nothing. Amen. When the raise comes, it's the Lord that did it. Come on. When the when the sins and the chains fall off, it's the Lord that set us free. Come on. When the kids turn out well, it's God that did it. Amen. When you leave the hospital in victory, it's the Lord. Lord that did it. Come on, somebody. Amen. Every blessing He pours out, you want to know what we do? We turn it back to praise. Come on. Do I got any praisers in the house today? Any believers in the house that want to worship Him? Amen. The third sign, you may be drifting. More, I got more luggage I can get through the door today. Number three, you should, you are complaining when you should be thanking. Another sign of drifting, complaining when you should be thanking. My father-in-law set me straight one day on the phone. He says to me, Bob, God don't like moaners and groaners. And it's true. My monk joined the monastery and took a vow of silence. After the first ten years, the superior called him in and asked, Do you have anything to say? The monk replied, Food bad. After another 10 years, he called him in, had the opportunity to voice his thoughts once again. He said, bed hard. Another 10 years went by, and he was again called in before his superior. And when he asked if he had anything to say, he responded, I quit. His superior said, it doesn't surprise me a bit. You've done nothing but complain ever since you've been here. How many you know you're going to be known by your words, right? We don't have any complainers here. No moaners or groaners. Judges 15, 18, we see Samson complaining. Actually, this is a prayer. It says, then he became very thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord. And he said, you have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. How do you know it's understandable that he's thirsty, right? I get it. Think of the effort required to swing a jawbone of a donkey with enough deadly force to kill a man a thousand times. He's thirsty. I get it. But in his prayer, he also takes credit for what he shouldn't be taking credit for because he says, this deliverance by the hand of your servant, right? It's like he did it all on his own. God empowers him to do something great, and then instead of thanking him for his touch, he starts complaining, I'm going to die of thirst. I'm going to fall into the hands of the Philistines. His prayer is really just a complaint, is it not? How many of you know that complaining about God's provision is actually insulting the very hand that blesses you? When you complain about God, you're really saying this to God. You're saying, God, you're just really not good enough. God, you're not faithful enough. Maybe you're not even big enough to provide for what I need. You're not even worthy to be trusted. Complaining shows a lack of trust in God. But I'm going to just show you today that God is good, right? How many say I'm not talking to God that way? Amen? I got that song that I sang, and it's my word, it's my praise to the Lord. It's my thankful song. All my life he has been faithful. Amen. Does anybody agree with that? I'm going to show you how good God is. Samson's there. He's moaning and groaning and complaining, thinking he's going to die of thirst. Judges 15 and verse 19, look what happens. So God split the hollow place that is in Lahi, and water came out, and he drank. And his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, he called its name El Hakore, which is in Lahi to this day. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of, Philist, of the Philistines. I mean, come on. How 
good is God anyway? How wonderful is God anyhow? Samson is literally moaning and groaning and complaining, but God overlooked all of that, opens up a spring out of a hollow place in the ground. I wonder, have you ever complained and the blessing came anyway? Come on. Have you ever been critical with God and He showed up anyway? Amen. Have you ever been faithless and God remained faithful? Woo! Hallelujah. Let me tell you why God does that. God knows our tendency to drift. As I was preparing this message here a while back, I got to this point in it and I said, Now what do I say, Lord? song came into my mind, and it's a true song. It's powerful. It says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never changes. How many of you know that little song? His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Great is thy faithfulness. Listen, when we are drifting from the Lord, God knows exactly what we need. God knows that we need refreshing. God knows that we are thirsty, right? God knows that we need His touch upon our life. Amen? And so I'm so grateful. By the way, He calls the spring in in Hecordi, which means the spring of Him that called. Not the spring of Him that provided, but the spring of Him that called. He was giving, He was giving actually... Himself the glory. Doesn't sound too much like praise. Would you stand with me today? Thank you for letting me just share the word.